Why? Do you have a preference? Oh, no, I don't <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have uh, two statements I would like to uh, make this afternoon, after which I'd be very happy, along with Mr. Vance, to try to uh, answer your questions. Uh, Phil, will be copies available after this? Yes, yes, there will be, yes. Uh, first, on Thursday and Friday of this week, I shall be meeting uh, here in Washington with the defense ministers of Canada, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Turkey, and the United Kingdom, along with the Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. These ministers comprise the new NATO Nuclear Planning Group, which together with the Nuclear Defense Affairs Committee was established as a permanent body of NATO by the Council of Ministers meeting in Paris last December. This body is to advise NATO on matters of nuclear policy. I'm especially pleased to be host of this meeting. It represents, I think, a significant new approach and an achievement after more than a decade of persistent endeavor by many uh, representatives of this government and many nations of NATO to bring all members of the Alliance into full partnership in the planning of nuclear strategy and nuclear affairs. It is, I think, a milestone in the history of NATO. The personal participation of the seven defense ministers reflects the intimate involvement of nationally responsible government leaders in NATO planning activities. Such active participation by top defense authorities is both new and, and also essential, I think, to assure realism in our work and the vigorous support of the member governments in carrying out uh, NATO's plans. It is, I think, largely responsible for the very great progress that we've made in the past two years in the field of nuclear planning. As you know, the foundation of the security of the alliance is nuclear power. And it's only natural, therefore, that the non-nuclear members of NATO have always felt a need to be informed about nuclear matters and nuclear planning, and particularly to participate in nuclear planning. They've been uncertain of their role in this field. They felt that uh, the organization structure of NATO and particularly the behavior of the United States did not take proper account of that role. They believed, and I think rightly so, that they should have had a greater voice in assessing the nuclear threat to the alliance, determining what forces were required to meet that threat, and in working out how and under what condition those nuclear forces would be employed. For more than 10 years, the NATO nations, including the United States, have struggled with this problem. A number of suggestions have been made as to how to solve it. I've listed eight. I won't go into them now, but I'll be happy to answer questions on them later. It's only been in the last year and a half, however, that substantial progress in expanding the role of the non-nuclear powers in nuclear affairs has been accomplished. The meeting this week stems from a proposal by the United States government in June of 1965 made to a meeting of the NATO defense ministers at that time. The proposal provided for consultation by a small group of defense ministers about the problems of nuclear planning. That group was set up. It met first in Paris in November of 1965. It met uh, four times last year, once in Washington, once in London, once in Paris, and once in Rome. Five defense ministers uh, acting as members of that group reviewed and discussed the strategic and the tactical nuclear resources of the alliance, potential circumstances and consequences of the use of nuclear weapons, and the way in which the alliance should organize to carry on future discussions of these subjects. These, I think, were by far the most substantive and the most far-reaching discussions of nuclear affairs in the history of the alliance. One of my colleagues stated just last month that there had been more progress in NATO nuclear matters in the past uh, 12 months than in the preceding 17 years. In any event, this working group of five defense ministers recommended that a permanent organization be created to carry on this work. And the Nuclear Affairs Committee, open to all NATO members, and the Nuclear Planning Group were established by the foreign and defense ministers of NATO last December in Paris. 
At this week's meeting, the nuclear planning group will continue to examine NATO nuclear strength in all of its aspects, including plans for the development of nuclear weapons, for the production of nuclear weapons, for the possible use of nuclear weapons, and for the analysis of the consequences of such use. In addition, we shall discuss the recent steps taken by the Soviet Union to deploy an anti-ballistic missile system, as well as the status of the anti-ballistic missile program of our own country. And we shall also discuss the effort being made by this country to persuade the Soviet Union to join with us in holding down the spiral of a fruitless arms race. And that, of course, is perhaps the most important subject on the agenda. And I'll be very brief in, in summarizing for you another matter. I want to report today on the completion on the target date set one year ago the massive relocation of U.S. armed forces from France. That relocation, which, as you'll recall, was prompted by a desire of the French government, will result in millions of dollars in economy for our forces in Europe without significantly degrading combat effectiveness. This relocation began in April of 1966, just a year ago. At that time, there were in France 32,000 U.S. military and civilian personnel about 38,000 of their dependents, and 15,000 French nationals employed by the Department of Defense, a total of some 85,000 personnel associated with U.S. defense activities. They were assigned to over 186 installations. Additionally, we leased about 250 uh, uh, installations and sites for our activities. The total cost for these physical facilities was huge, about $850 million. And when the relocation began, there were over 820,000 tons of material that we were using or had stored in France, material which had a value of about a billion, two hundred million dollars. Initially, it was estimated that the relocation of these men and facilities would cost over one billion dollars. We've been able to do the job for less than 150 million. And of that 150 million, only 50 million will be paid out in foreign exchange. We now estimate there will actually be budgetary savings of perhaps $50 million a year resulting from this program, and foreign exchange savings in excess of $100 million per year, perhaps between $110 and $120 million. Of course, these major economies would mean very little to us if the relocation had significantly or adversely affected our military strength and capability, but such is not the case. Combat effectiveness and fulfillment of NATO commitments, we believe, has and will be maintained. In some instances, because of changes in the logistics net and warehousing facilities, there will actually be modernization gains. And in addition, headquarters organizations have been streamlined. As a result, the relocation has permitted us to save about 16,000 of the military personnel formerly located in France and about 2,000 of those located in Germany reduction of about 18,000 in military personnel. In dependence of those personnel that will be moved out of Europe total 19,000 from France and 2,000 from Germany, so there's 18,000 military personnel plus about 21,000 dependents that will be saved, a total of 39,000 U.S. personnel moving from Europe to the U.S. In addition, in contrast to the 15,000 French nationals formerly employed by the Department of Defense in France for our activities, we'll require only 4,000 European nations. So there'll be a saving of about 11,000 European nations. A total of 50,000 people, therefore, that will be disassociated from U.S. defense activities in Europe. Because we wish to ease the personal hardships as much as possible, arrangements were made for about 6,000 U.S. personnel, a large number of them either students or those associated with dependent schools serving those students, to remain in France with the approval of that government until the end of this month, or I should say till the end of June. We've moved more than 380,000 tons of the material we had in France to Germany, more than 145,000 tons to the UK, about 90,000 tons have been returned to this country because they were excess to our requirements in Europe. We've either consumed or disposed of another 170,000 tons of excess material, and there's now less than 10,000 of the former 820,000 tons of U.S. material in France. Most of this 10,000 tons is connected with the dependence of schools. So 
for all practical purposes, the relocation has been completed. I think it's been a magnificent job. Great credit to the officers and men of our European forces who participated in it and directed that. We think the job has been done, it's been done expeditiously and effectively. And now, Mr. Vance and I would be very happy to try to answer your question. Yes. Mr. Secretary, there is a wire service story today that says the Defense Department has started a study of the profits of the defense industry in connection with the Vietnam War. Is this true? No, there's no substance to that whatsoever. Uh, about five or six years ago, we began a, a study of the profits of the defense industry, which we're continuing to carry on, in order to relate profit to performance. Initially, it became very clear that, that because of the heavy emphasis on cost plus type contracts in prior years, there was very little variation in profit rate by contract. We are seeking to, to change that. As you know, the cost plus type contracts doubled from about 19% of total defense awards in 1956 to about 38% in 1961. We've cut that back to about 10%. As we did so, we sought to give the defense contractors greater incentive to perform more efficiently. This meant that we tried to change the profit rates by type of contracts so that those contracts which carried with them greater risk would also carry with them greater profit potential. In order to do this, in order to make these studies, in order to monitor our performance, we, of course, needed more information on defense contractors' profits. We're continuing to seek that, solicit it, and I suspect that it's those requests which have led to the uh, comments that occurred in the press, yes. How are the savings you mentioned uh, with the move uh, out of France, how are they realized? Uh, let me tell you first of the uh, combat or operational units we had in France. They were limited to two air transport squadrons which have been moved to the United Kingdom. Uh, three reconnaissance squadrons also moved to the United Kingdom. Two reconnaissance squadrons moved back to the United States with dual bases, bases in the U.S. and also bases forward in Western Europe, to which they will move periodically for exercises during the year. And one reconnaissance squadron uh, in France on temporary duty during a, a transition from one type of aircraft to another, which has been moved permanently back to the United States. This movement of air squadrons permitted uh, uh, a very substantial reduction in the number of Air Force personnel associated with our activities in France without any significant uh, change in the effectiveness of our air capability. In the case of the Army, there were no operational units, what I would call operational units in France. Rather, it was uh, staffed with personnel designed to support our line of communication that ran through France. We've been able to move that line of communication to the Low Countries and to Western Germany. Now, true, it's more vulnerable, it's more exposed in the Low Countries than it would have been in France. But since the strategy of NATO is a strategy of forward defense rather than defense in depth, this uh, slight increase in the vulnerability or exposure of that line of communication, we believe, does not significantly weaken NATO. It does result in a very substantial saving because the line is shorter and it's uh, more efficiently located in relation to rail and road nets than was the line of communication in France. And this has led to a very substantial reduction in the number of personnel necessary to make maintain and man that line of communication. Yeah. In your appearance before the Senate Armed Services Committee about two months ago, at the end of January, I believe, there are a couple of things you talked about in relation to the Soviet anti-ballistic missile system. One of the things you said was that the systems deployed around Moscow was not at that time operational. And another thing, uh, you weren't too sure about uh, uh, whether the second <coughs> system was really an ABM. As a matter of fact, I think you said that the trend was away from suspecting it was an ABM. Uh, can you answer now whether in the last 60 days you have any information that the system around Moscow is operational? I don't wish to add to what I said at that time other than to perhaps uh, clarify a point that may have uh, been confused. I've noticed in the press a number of uh, statements indicating that there was controversy inside the Department of Defense as to whether the second system so-called talent system uh, was or was not an anti-ballistic missile system. Frankly, I don't think it makes very much difference uh, what the evidence indicates at the present time, because I believe we must assume for our planning purposes that uh, if that second system is not an anti-ballistic missile system, 
that the Soviets uh, may at some time in the future uh, deploy an anaplastic missile system to protect those portions of their country outside the Moscow area. Uh, this is essentially the same statement I made to you a year ago and two years ago, I think, when you questioned me then about intelligence information on Soviet anaplastic missile deployment. I said that I wasn't going to comment upon intelligence data, but I would tell you that we must assume, planning our future offensive forces, that the Soviets would deploy, deploy a countrywide uh, anaplastic missile system. And that's what I intended to say in January, and I may not have said it uh, clearly enough. Yeah. Secretary, uh, the Russians have tried to tie together the ABM issue with the offensive missile system as far as discussions on the ABM freeze or whatever you might call it. Do you, as Secretary of Defense, uh, consider it conceivable that we would be able to negotiate on our offensive missile force as part of the attempt to get an agreement to uh, forego the ABM? Well, I, I don't wish to speculate on uh, what conclusions might come out of negotiations with the Soviet Union on the subject of nuclear forces. There has been some indication that they would wish to discuss both offensive and defensive forces, and we're certainly uh, willing for discussion purposes to include both on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, this meeting that you're going to have with the NATO officials sounds very good, but uh, have you actually cleared this with Congress? Is it legal for you to give away this information to these non-nuclear parties? We, we, as you imply, operate under uh, legislative restrictions as to what kind of information we can expose to foreign nationals, and we're adhering very strictly to those legislative restrictions in all of our discussions with, with NATO. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, uh, as I understood you at the start of the uh, conference, you said that the NATO relocation meant millions of dollars in savings without degrading the combat effectiveness of our forces. Yes, that's that correct. Well, good. Why didn't we do it a long time ago? Well, I think that's a good question. Uh, I, I think that's a good question. I've asked myself that. Uh, matter of fact, and I think the answer is that conditions have changed significantly uh, since the French base structure was, was established. For example, our aircraft are long-range aircraft. The aircraft we moved to, to Great Britain, the transport aircraft, were not the aircraft for which the transport bases were established in France. The transport bases were established for C-119 aircraft, which are very short-range aircraft. The aircraft that we now have deployed in uh, Western Europe, particularly those that we moved from France to the UK or C-130 aircraft. Similarly, the aircraft for which the bases were established for reconnaissance purposes in France were short-range aircraft. Uh, those we moved to the United Kingdom were long-range reconnaissance aircraft, F-4s, having replaced RF-101s, which in turn had replaced a, a still shorter-range aircraft earlier. But having said all of that, I do want to emphasize the conditions today are much different than those uh, uh, 15 years ago when those bases were established. When I, having said all that, I don't want to imply that there isn't any penalty associated with uh, moving our lines of communication out of France. Of course, there is. it's not a significant penalty. It doesn't, uh, in a major way, degrade the combat effectiveness, but it is a it is a penalty. Uh, it it uh, shortens the line of communication, but it. Uh, Results in a more vulnerable line of communication. Yeah, let me take another question. Yes. <laughs> if uh, our allies are going to participate now in nuclear policy, I was wondering why there are seven rather than 15. Because I think that, that the members of NATO realize what we have learned in trying to carry out these discussions that these subjects uh, require the most intimate participation by the defense ministers themselves, and we've simply found it impossible to do that with uh, 14 or 15 members present plus their staff, so that it has been agreed after a year and a half or two of experimentation that we should start with a small group, a relatively small group of seven nations, and this group of seven nations should report back periodically once every six or twelve months to the larger group. At any time, the larger group uh, has the prerogative of uh, asking that the small group be expanded. But Oh, yes, indeed. The whole purpose of the, the meeting is to expose the non-nuclear nations more more fully and more intimately to the entire spectrum of nuclear activity, starting with the analysis of the threat, 
consideration of the research and development programs necessary to assure weapons will be developed to meet that threat effectively, the determination of the size of the force structure, the uh, strategy to provide for the use of that structure, and the tactical and operational plans uh, contemplating such use. Yes? Will, will these discussions include possible use of nuclear weapons in areas other than in NATO? The discussion will be limited to uh, NATO operations. Let me take one over here, Doug. Mr. Secretary, have the talks with the UK and Germany reached the point where you now say that the US will be able to keep the present six divisions in Europe? I don't want to uh, comment upon the trilateral talks. These are the discussions with the United Kingdom and the Federal Republic relating to uh, force requirements and certain associated financial problems. Uh, these trilateral discussions are still underway. They haven't been concluded, and any uh, uh, tentative conclusions of those trilateral discussions must later be discussed with NATO, with the full membership of NATO, before uh, final decisions are made by any of the members of NATO, and that includes the United States and certainly the United Kingdom and the Federal Republic. Yes. Does your statement that we have a forward strategy without a defensive tip and also the absence of France from the planning now mean an earlier use of nuclear weapons than was the case at some prior time? No, I think not. I think what it, it emphasizes is that the deployment of troops, the uh, tactical plans are associated with a defense of the territory of Western Europe far forward on the uh, eastern boundaries of, of Western Europe, and uh, does not contemplate a withdrawal or giving up a territory and a movement uh, uh, to a defensive depth, such as occurred during uh, World War II. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe that uh, a future conflict would evolve as did World War II. Uh, in a world in which uh, each side possesses large numbers of nuclear weapons, it's inconceivable to me that there would be such a protracted conflict. I think I've uh, mentioned to you before that uh, the stockpile of nuclear weapons in Western Europe provided for the use of NATO has doubled in the last six years and now uh, in the order of 7,000 weapons. It's inconceivable to me that you would have a, a long, extended uh, three or four year conflict under those circumstances. Yes. Mr. Secretary, uh, there have been a lot of comments lately about the problems that <coughs> Negro servicemen have in getting off these houses. Could you explain what the Department of Defense position is in regard to all this? Yes, this, this is a very serious problem. It's one that uh, Mr. Vance and I are both concerned with. He, in particular, has been working on it, and I'd like to ask him to comment on this question. This is a very serious and difficult question. Uh, we are at the present time giving intensive study to the problem in 13 selected areas on the basis of this intensive work which is going forward. We hope that we will be able to move forward more rapidly, eliminating this discrimination. Uh, it's a problem with which we are seized and with which we must make progress. Uh, Mr. McNamara and I are devoting a great deal of time to this, along with uh, Secretary Morris, and uh, hope that we can come forward with some constructive action in the not too distant future. Deadline for that report, sir? I have no deadline at this point. 13 areas? Yes, uh, I don't have them on hand, but I'd be happy to make that available. Yes. Secretary, Senator Simon is saying that our failure to bomb the North Vietnamese airfield is costing us hundreds of planes and hundreds of airplanes. Is our decision not to bomb them based on military reasons or diplomatic reasons or what? Well, I, it's based on our desire to avoid widening the war, to <laughs> seek to obtain our political objective, which is a very limited objective, the smallest possible cost in American lives. And we think the present tactics uh, are best suited 
to those two objectives. As you know, we have lost about 500 aircraft uh, attacking the lines of communication and other targets in North Vietnam. Of that 500, uh, something on the order of 40 have been lost to surface-to-air missile attacks. To date, there have been over 1,900 such attacks in the past uh, roughly year and a half or year and uh, eight months. <coughs> so only a small percentage of the losses have been lost to surface-to-air missiles. In part, this accounts for the fact that uh, only a small percentage of our sorties are directed against surface-to-air missile sites. Only a small percentage of the total of 500 aircraft have been lost to MiG attacks. I believe it's on the order of 10 U.S. aircraft that have been lost to MiG attacks compared to roughly 40 uh, MiG aircraft that have been uh, shot down in air battles with, with U.S. aircraft. We think that uh, at least under present circumstances, and this belief can change as time goes by, but we think that un at least under present circumstances, the loss in U.S. lives will be less if we pursue our present uh, target policies than they would be were we to uh, attack those airfields. It's always a uh, balancing of gains and losses in terms of U.S. lives and U.S. political objectives. Yeah. About our relocation of troops in France, uh, uh, Senator Greening recently came out with a report, which we were familiar with, saying that our government lost $1 billion uh, with this relocation. And $1 billion loss of <laughs> airports and hospitals. We said the fault is that we have not negotiated with France. And then he said they did, sir, by saying that this will happen again in other countries where other forces have been relocated. Oh, I, I assume that he was uh, deriving his conclusion from the fact that the value of U.S. occupied bases and facilities in France approximated uh, $850 million, very close to his, his billion. A portion of that, by the way, had been financed by NATO infrastructure payments and, in a sense, uh, was a multilaterally financed facility. But it is true that we did occupy uh, facilities in France, costing about $850 million, uh, and that no financial settlement relating to those facilities has yet been made. But negotiations are underway both by the United States and other members of NATO with France seeking such a financial solution. I can't uh, predict now either when they will be concluded or what the uh, conclusions will be following the uh, termination of the, of the negotiation. Let me take a question here. Yes. Uh, could you tell us when we might expect the uh, release of the Senate's report on the ammunition uh, from the uh, uh, security review? I believe that the staff of the committee and, and uh, members of the department are still discussing the issues. I know there was a meeting last Friday uh, uh, on it, and I don't think either the staff worked by the committee or working in the department has been completed on that date. So I can only tell you that work is proceeding but hasn't been completed. The one from last year, sir. Thank you. I, that's a good time. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the answer to your question is I, I don't know. I don't think that report is still in. Can I get one clarification? 